Westminster table, and for two days a week, I work with my colleague um, Karen Shaw for NHS Improvement on a um, clinical fellowship. And um, one of the work streams that um, I was assigned for the last um, financial year was a package of catheter tools, um, which is what today's launch and what today's session is about. So. Some of you will have heard a lot of this already, so I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of, of why I was assigned the um, task or responsibility to do this. Um, and I know a lot of this was covered this morning, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you're all aware, I'm quite sure by now, of the um, action plan, the new action plan that was launched, the one that before that, and the target, obviously, or objective or ambition to reduce gram-negative bloodstream infections. Um, you'll be aware that that's been revised and that was outlined in the um, new five-year action plan that was launched a couple of weeks ago. And um, you'll be aware there that there's a, the 25 and 50% reduction in all gram-negative bloodstream infections. Um, and I'm sure you're all very aware that a lot of the modelling Public Health England colleagues have done is that um, around 80% of these cases are community onset. So, and I'm sure I know a lot of you will have seen this infographic before um, because it's been, it's been in many presentations, but um, this is an infographic, again, produced by colleagues in Public Health England um, from last year's data. And again, you'll see there that we, as um, my background, and obviously I am a qualified infection prevention and control nurse, spent many years um, tackling, like I'm sure a lot of you have, MRSA and Clostridium difficile. But you'll be aware from this, this infographic here and from the information you've had this morning that the burden pros, particularly by E. coli bacteremia, um, this infographic shows um, is, is, is vastly greater now than some of the burden posed by some of those other organisms without wanting to, of course, devalue the importance, of course, of tackling those as well. Um, again, some of the stuff that's out there, this is widely available information, um, is that the, the risk groups for this, this, particular, uh, this particular infection are the elderly, um, tends to affect um, males, females, You've got that sort of sort of down there, but the most common source you'll see in the um, circular infographic on the right of the screen is urinary tract infection. You'll see there it's around 49%. So to put a lot of people's local data tends to vary, but if you are looking at this locally, I think most people tend to see this sort of split if, if the numbers vary slightly area to area, and, and urinary tract infections tends to be quite large. And, and most cases of community onset, this sort of 81, 80% that are in the first three days of admission. I think that probably tends to be pretty standard. And indeed, we've just started looking at my own cases locally in Kent and Medway, and we're seeing a very similar picture there as well. A lot of you, again, will have seen this. This is the national position as of um, December last year. This is information, that, again, that's widely available and comes out um, um, nationally. And you'll see there that um, really, when we look at this, a lot of the data is suggesting that although the, 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 the rates, if you like, have slowed, certainly one could argue that a lot, of, a lot of the aspects of the ambition aren't really being met when you look at some of this data that's, that's coming through. Uh, but it, what's really interesting is, is the next graph, in my view, is if you split that between um, hospital onset or acute onset versus community onset, what, what, what is then come, becomes more obvious with this um, sort of semi-green, sort of emerald green line you see on the bottom graph. Unfortunately, I haven't got a pointer. Um, but you'll see there that actually the cases that are acute onset are by, by and large achieving some reductions. And those by and large seem to be sustained. It's the community onset cases where possibly one might argue and I'm no statistician, but what the statisticians tell me is that it's the community onset where we're not, we're not seeing those, those reductions at the, at the speed perhaps one would like to see. So 
with that in mind, Karen and I are part of a team whereby the last year, so last April, um, there were nine projects approved by a programme board um, in order to try and help support the system in reducing E. coli bloodstream infection. And my work stream in terms of these catheter um, resources sits in work stream five. But some of you here may well be aware of some of the others. I don't know whether anyone's attended some of the UTI collaboratives that have been held nationally. You may well have taken part in some of them. Some of your colleagues may have taken part in the DIPSI executive development programme that's been... Um, running nationally, they've had two cohorts of students through. Um, so there's a lots of work streams going on. This, this is just a small part of, of, a, of a bigger bundle. So moving on to the catheter tools and hoping this link works. What I did initially was, um, I, was I did literature search, as one would expect. Um, the literature is, um, and I've got the results of the literature search here with me, so I've got a full package here of all the references. There's quite a lot, so I didn't put them on a slide, but there's about 100 copies here, so if anyone wants a copy, it's freely available for you at the end, and it's also on the website. Um, so I did a literature search, and then I advertised via the IPS, Twitter, and one or two other mediums, for a number of um, national stakeholders to come and work with me to try and develop these tools. A lot of them supplied me with their catheter passport that they already used, their inpatient care pathway that they already use, um, cards that they gave patients. So what we did as a task and finish group really was looked at the literature, looked at what resources were all out there and tried to come to a consensus about what we felt as a group of professionals that this, this package of tools needed to look like. And, and really, one of the main motivators was do, for doing it was I attended some of the first UTI collaboratives. And what a lot of providers were saying to me is, Esther, we, we have to, we're developing this in this trust, that trust, this system, that system. Can we not just have one that we can download and that everyone can use? Why do I have to spend months on it and somebody else has to spend months on it? If you want to do something useful, was the basic message, could you do that for us, really? Because that would be, we, we would actually find quite useful. So hence the, the sort of direction of travel to get this done. So I'm hoping this opens. It opened before. Marvellous. So the link that went live this morning is this. So the first page you will come to, it's on the NHS. So most of you will be familiar with the NHSI resource hub. So it's got its own page. And the catheter passport, there's actually three versions of it. Now, it's not because we've gone mad. Um, a lot of the feedback when we consulted on this was that people wanted, people felt it was too big. And other people felt, believe it or not, that it was not big enough. So what we've done <laughs> to satisfy all requirements is there's one big catheter passport with your patient information in it and your bits and pieces for your clinicians to write on. But you can also print it off separately. So if, if you may have a group of patients for whom they've already had the patient information 50-odd times, why do you need to give it to them again just because their booklet's run out? You might just want to use the clinical section. Or you might just want to give someone the patient information for whatever reason. So in a response to that consultation feedback, we thought if we separate it into the three, then providers, people such as yourselves, have got, have got that um, decision-making. You, you can decide how you want to implement it in your area. So, and again, I'm not going to take you through page by page. I'm just... Because the, the, you can skim through these, but... As I say, these were the results of some of the stakeholder work we did. So we started off with the demographics, who the patient is, and in the main passport then, you've got this patient information section first. So it talks about what a catheter is, it talks about washing, it talks about hand hygiene, obviously, as you would expect. Um, it talks about securing the catheter, um, a leg bag, caring for your leg bag, how to change the leg bag. Um, using a valve instead of a trainage bag and what the patient may need to do. There's a little bit of information on sexual intercourse when you've got a urinary catheter. Um, and then stuff around bowel care and how to maintain, hopefully, a healthy bowel so that um, you don't get any problems. And then a little infographic there around the kind of colour urine. It doesn't probably show that well on the screen, but obviously in the printed, high print definitions, it will show up. And then there's a little troubleshooting 
guide there. Um, so if a patient's got a problem, they can hopefully go through the troubleshooting guide. And then it moves on to when to seek help, urinary tract infections. So again, we've tried to use very simple language. So I worked on this. Once the task and finish group had concluded the work, it went to people far more knowledgeable than I in NHSI around patient experience and around the language you would necessarily use with a patient. So some of the consultation feedback said, why would we use words like tummy, for example, that didn't, people didn't feel it was very professional. But actually, when the patient side of things looked at things, said, actually, that's the word we do need you to use, tummy rather than abdomen. So that, that's the reason for some of the language in here. This section is very much aimed at patients. So it does talk about bugs. It talks about tummies. It talks about we, rather than, rather than using um, medical names for things. And then we get to the next section. Um, which is the catheterisation record, which is where you'll see throughout the resources a strong um, link to Houdini, which we've slightly adapted. Um, again, based on a lot on feedback we had and some of the professional input we have from people. So whilst we haven't changed the criteria, what we've done is added more description to that criteria just to make it a little bit more simple in terms of how someone might adapt it. Um, some of the feedback I had, and we'll go on to implementation in a minute from the consultation, was that Houdini's not widely known within the community. However, some of the other feedback I had was from some community trusts that have adopted Houdini in the community and who have adopted it very, very well in the community. So um, it, obviously it's very difficult with these things when you're doing something for a national footprint, but what, what a number of people did say is even if they didn't use Houdini, they taught those reasons for why a catheter needed to be in, even if they didn't call it Houdini as such, um, hence, hence the descriptions. So what people wanted then in the start was a bit about catheter maintenance solutions, which she says sort of ducking really, because I'm aware that there is a lot of debate about catheter maintenance solutions and should they shouldn't be used. Um, the research is, isn't really out there to come down one side or the other. We've put them in, in case it's in somebody, an area's policy or guideline or procedure to use them, but we've been very bland about it. There's not a recommendation to use them or not to use them. There's just a space to document them if it's the decision you're, you, you've taken to use them. Traumatic removals, um, then obviously the bit about corti, so obviously a, a thing there about not using a dipstick. Um, is the patient MRSA positive? What have you diagnosed? And then you have the catheterisation record, which we would try to make throughout. A lot of the feedback from everyone on the task and finish group was that they wanted this to be really simple. Nurses hadn't got time to be spent writing lots and lots every time they did something. They wanted tick boxes. They wanted something that was really simple to fill in because then that would give them um, the, the, the increased user uptake, I suppose. Um, we also worked with PHE colleagues um, there's a piece of work, some of you may have been involved in it, in fact Anna's here somewhere, um, around behaviourally what will impact on a clinician's ability to provide catheter care and provide it properly. So we changed some of the language. Instead of just putting signature, name a res pers professional responsible for the decision to recatheterize, because we thought that was an important distinction, not just the person who's done it, but the person who's res been responsible for making that decision. So there's a quite a few of those to allow for catheter changes. Bear in mind, this is, this is ideally for use in the community. There's a page for a trial without catheter, um, if it's done. And that's the end of the passport section. So the other, as I say, the other ones on the site, just get back to me, that's it. The other two are just the same thing, split in half. And then the catheter card is for people who you assess aren't going to carry that passport. There's just no way. They don't carry anything. So they're not going to bring a passport. But they might carry a mobile phone 
with a little slot for a credit card. They, they might just do that. They might carry a wallet, they might carry a purse. You might get them to agree to carry a catheter card. And the card was actually developed um, in Shropshire. So the card wasn't um, an idea that, or anything to do, really, that I developed. Uh, one of the ladies on the Task and Finish group was working as part of a health economy in Shropshire, and they're credited on the site. Um, and they'd been using it with some success uh, for this very group of patients who wouldn't carry a catheter passport uh, with, the, with the argument it was better than them carrying nothing at all. This at least gave you some information, even if it's not as... as um, not as detailed as the one in the passport. And they're credited there, you can see on the, the website. Um, the inpatient care plan was something that we were very much requested to, to develop at the collaboratives. So this, the idea about this is, is for anyone receiving 24-hour nursing care. So you could be in a nursing home, a community hospital, um, an acute sector, ITU. The, the idea is that this, this would be one, but you need to be receiving 24-hour nursing care, otherwise this doesn't make sense. And a lot of the comments on the consultation about the TWAT pathway at the end of this, if, anyone's, if anyone commented on them, was like, we couldn't do this in the patient's home. Well, no, you couldn't. The idea about this is it's very much a, an inpatient um, document. So we've got the Houdini criteria there, but in this case with a little addendum, and this was because learning the professional group that I was working with, and I've certainly seen it myself, I'm sure you have, patients who come in with dementia or delirium who possibly do fit this criteria and someone puts a catheter in them and it just makes the situation ten times worse. And actually that's why we've put in here, is there something else you could try? Could you try thinking about intermittent self-catheterisation, um, either by the patient themselves or by a carer being trained how to do that? We've got the bit in there about consent, a place for you to record if they got a passport or not when they come in, and that was really to facilitate auditing. So we designed this with yes, no answers, very much with the, the ability to think, well, actually, is this a document then that if you wanted to go back and audit against your guideline policy procedure, you'd be able to do that? Records of insertion, very, I'm sure this is all the sorts of things you've got on similar documents if you've got them. And again, these sort of warning bubbles. Um, and then the next bit, which may be a bit difficult to see on the screen, but what you will base, again, feedback from users was that what nurses on the wards particularly haven't got time to do is, again, fill in another piece of paperwork. And for those of you who work in inpatient settings, I'm sure you could see the groans now if you went round with another piece of paper that somebody had to fill in. So the feedback was, could we just, again, have things we can circle, have things that we can tick, have things that we can sign, rather than having to write. So the idea was, you've got the days down the side, only 10 days, because we'd like to think the catheter would be out by then, and you'd have to physically go and get another piece of paper. Um, so, and then we've got all the things that you would want implemented. A lot of this you'll see very similar from that in the high impact interventions around catheter care, what's in the RCN catheter care guidelines. So you've got um, cleaning of the genitals, hand hygiene, catheter be secure, secure high connection, hydration, constipation. Page for, const uh, page for a TWOC, and then the final page is a suggested TWOC flowchart. And I think what confused everyone was box one, plan time for removal, 6 a.m. or midnight, or in inpatient settings, or early morning in the community. What I really meant was early morning in the community, but still receiving 24-hour nursing care. Um, but clearly there's not enough room for that in a box. So we have put that in the explanation on the site, that this is very much designed as a tool for people receiving 24-hour nursing care. And then the final tool, and again, this came out of the research, is just to support you, because if you haven't got any of these tools in place already, you're going to want to roll it out. You're going to want some sort of education program. You're going to want to share it with your colleagues. So the idea about this card, this is very much staff aimed, staff interface aimed, was that this could be, you know, you've probably seen the sepsis credit cards that people have. They have it for all sorts, don't they? Falls, um, all sorts. That you could print out this 
issue it to staff, have it printed up, and if you felt it might be useful, then you could go ahead and use it. And it's just really got some of the key points that you would have to have in place to stop a courty. Obviously, the, the biggest one is don't put the catheter in the first place, but if you're going to, these, the things in the bubble would be what you would have in place. Remove post-operatively within 24 hours about the closed system, uninterrupted flow. And it just gives a useful handheld reminder. And then what the girls in the um, promotions team have managed to do is they've also put it on a poster. Because a lot of the consultation feedback said, we like the cards, but can we also have a poster? So the people in media said, of course you can have a poster. So they've, they've moved it onto a poster. And then you'll see on the site excuse me, there's the references there. We were hoping to get the references and the credits on the tools themselves, but it just provided for the publishing team an absolute nightmare. So we have put them there because we, we did want to, uh, certainly me, did want to strongly emphasise the fact I have done none of the research that sits behind this. The re all I did was a literature search and took the information from work other people have done. And I, I would hate to think anyone thought that <laughs> that, that was the case. So, moving on, a lot of the comments to the consultation were around, this is all well and good, Esther, which they didn't use my name, that would have been freaky, but this is all very well and good, but these don't work, actually, these won't work, we've tried them and they don't work. And I suppose my response to that would be, no, they won't on their own. What you need to do, these are only tools and they're part, they should be part of an implementation bundle. They should be part of a programme that you've got in place to launch. It needs to be managed like any project and sustained like any project. And I, I, again, I won't, I won't sort of uh, preach to the converted about how you manage a project, but, but that, that, would, that would have been my sort of answer to that, really, in terms of the consultation. And a very useful tool for thinking about this, shared by my um, colleague Karen, who, who, who'd been recently introduced to it at a conference, hadn't you, Karen, was, that, was this tool, which is a tool, really. It's not a bundle in itself, we're informed. It's a tool to hang a bundle off. And again, Karen's got several copies of this that she's printed out. You've got, she's got 100. Um, whether they could have perhaps two or three each. Yeah. Um, and what who are suggesting is you come up with a plan, basically. You understand what you want to change, which we've got that now, haven't we? We've got the tools, if you would like to adopt these as a health economy, that you provide training and education, you put in place some form of monitoring, some form of audit, some form of feedback. You sell it that you go area to area, ward to ward, team of nurses to team of nurses, division to division, group of doctors to group of doctors, to actually sell it to them in whatever way works best for them. And then you live it, i.e. you work on how you're actually going to embed it. And what I have bitter experience of personally as an ICN as I'm sure you all have is implementing something that's absolutely wonderful and you go back six months later and nobody's doing it so this gives you a tool to sort of hang off right okay if we're going to do this we're going to do it properly and we're going to do it to try and sustain it so one of the things that Karen and I hoped to do but there are a lot of people in here for us to do this is we wanted to try and perhaps instigate some sort of debate from yourselves, if that's okay. So you didn't know you were going to be asked to actually do something, did you? Um, whether you can think of any way that if you worked as part of either a health economy or if you're here with colleagues from your own trust, but if, you, if you're here with colleagues that are all working the same health economy, perhaps a community trust, a hospital, that you could perhaps get into groups of four, five, six, and give some thoughts to how you, you've got these tools, they've landed on your, in your email this morning or tomorrow, right, how would I go about implementing these either in my trust or in my health economy or with my patients to make sure that in 12 months' time, everyone who's got a, pa a urinary catheter has got a passport and everyone that's got a urinary catheter needs one which is, I think, something we'd probably all like to see. <laughs> and my col this is where Karen comes in. Karen and I are going to circulate. 
been lots of discussion in the room and lots of comments. Some of the comments I've picked up on that people have made is about making sure that you involve your CCG colleagues, um, that they're the one common denominator, the commissioners, um, for all providers locally. And now I have, through my UTI collaborative work, um, been made aware that some of my CCG colleagues are very... Um, keen on infection prevention and control and largely supportive of all the providers that they've got working for them. Other CCGs perhaps have got other priorities at the moment and aren't necessarily, they're all perhaps in slightly different places, but where you have got a CCG lead in IPC or a quality lead in your CCG um, that is taking the lead with this, it, it might be an idea to involve them. Other colleagues at the back were saying about involving the independent sector as well. So a, a number of our patients now um, are seen in the independent sector for part or, or all of their pathway, depending on what they're having done. So it was about involving them. Um, so some of the um, other suggestions or things that I've had fed back to me that works well is working together as a whole health economy, or for those who are familiar with the term STP footprint, so um, or region, whatever you're calling your area where you are. Um, don't forget ambulance trusts. One of the things we found out locally was that um, ambulance trusts um, have a sort of tick list, for want of a better word, of things to remember when you bring a patient into hospital. And on their list is, of course, current medication, anticoagulation book. I asked the guy, could we add to the list um, catheter passport? Oh, yeah, of course you can, he said. No problem. Um, simple as that. Uh, and such a simple thing, I, wouldn't, well, I didn't necessarily immediately think of, um, was, was actually a really good idea. Now, still, that relies on it being in the home and not locked away somewhere or under the cat or wherever else it might be. But at least it's another route to get them brought into hospital. The other issue I think I heard one or two people talking about is a lot of areas you've got multiple providers with lots of different policies, lots of different guidelines. Um, is it possible to standardise that? I know, uh, speaking to a colleague earlier, and it, she's presenting on it later on today, about the new RCN guidance around catheter care. And I know the um, five-year plan talked about having standardised IPC policies. I'm not sure whether catheter care will be part of that, but one of the things we've done in Kent and Medway is we've put together one Kent and Medway catheter insertion management guideline, and that was worked on collaboratively. So it goes across all providers, including primary care, that are also providing catheter care for us in our area. So that might be a tool. It was a bit of a labour of love because there was World War III and more between different groups of continence experts and neurologists there really was, particularly around catheter washouts, catheter maintenance solutions and securing devices. So I wanted to bang their heads together in the nicest possible way and I said, you're the professional experts, there's no evidence you need to come to a consensus. Um, have, can you use, the red, for those of you who've got the red bags perhaps in your care homes some people are nodding some people are saying what's she on about but a lot of areas have introduced red bags now for people going in and out of hospital when they live in a care home we've had catheter passports added to that for both sides of the journey again it's only as good as the person filling it in but it's another reminder to take it with you um, would cards help as we've already discussed. And then think about how you're going to audit this. We've talked a bit about the implementation, and we've talked about my experiences of going through all this, thinking things are all tickety-boo, and then five, six months later discovering actually nobody's using it, regardless of whatever, whatever you're talking about. So, you know, how, how are you going to monitor this? How are you going to keep people on top of it? Whatever audit tools you already use, can this be added to it rather than creating a new industry? If you've already got systems whereby your um, ICNs or critical care nurses or whoever visit wards to see patients while they're there, could they look and see whoever's got a catheter, have a quick look and see if they got the appropriate documentation there? That's probably going to, going to take a couple of minutes. Um, and it's something I know a colleague does in a community trust when um, her nurses visit wards and departments. Um, and have you engaged procurement and pharmacy teams, particularly procurement, 
um, around the products they buy, but pharmacy teams, particularly in the community, meds management, do a lot of visits to a lot of places. And they're often more than amenable to check something's there for you if you, were, if you add it to their list. Right, what people don't like, as you probably know, is another sheet of paper. But if you can add it to the bit of paper they've already got, they tend to be okay with an extra line rather than an extra whole piece of paper. Mm -hmm.